good at this. <laughs> um, shorthand, a key to new historical evidence. There's documents in archives probably all over the English-speaking world that are not catalogable because there's no English words in them. They look something like this. Um, that uh, people don't know how to decipher and are considered generally undecipherable. And I came across this one in my studies of Robert Erskine, the Scottish engineer and inventor who came here to the United States in 1771 and got caught up in the American Revolution. He became George Washington's map maker and then he died in 1780. Um, of exposure while out making maps. So I've been studying him since I, before I came back here to NJIT. And um, the bottom thing in his archives that I hadn't looked at was this. It's always been there. I, like everybody else, ignored it for a long time because I didn't know what it was. So I just said to myself, someday, and then eventually someday arrive. And I decided I had to decipher this. I had to figure out what it was. At first, I thought it was some sort of code and uh, a cipher, and I started researching that. But that turned out uh, not to be anything that I could recognize. And I printed this out, and I started carrying it with me to conferences and to meetings and showing it to people and saying, have you ever seen anything like that? And eventually, somebody said to me, oh, that looks like Pittman shorthand. And so I figured out it was shorthand. This is shorthand. These documents, there's 13 of them, they're in the New Jersey Historical Society in downtown Newark. But I know there's other documents elsewhere. Like for instance, I've heard that the, some of the Salem witch trials were taken down in shorthand. So there's, there's probably documents all over that have data that people have been ignoring for years for this same reason. Um, so I started to research it, and that the year of this one is 1850, or 1758. So I started uh, researching, and in researching I found that there were hundreds and hundreds of different types of shorthands. England had shorthand before the continent. Um, English shorthand was being used before they developed French and German shorthand. And in fact, when France and Germany started developing it, they used English versions. So there were probably about 20, 30 manuals in the 1700 time period. But when you go further closer to the pre present, the number of manuals just absolutely um, skyrockets. So this is 1800. I had to break it up into chunks. And at one point, I was writing a history of all of this which was all very good and everything, and um, I'm still planning on doing that. And I've read a lot of these. I have a lot of it in my head. There were a lot of histories written up until about uh, 1920 or so. And then the, the history of shorthand is that basically aristocrats used it up until um, about 1840 and 1840 when they built railroads and had the penny post suddenly everybody started using it and there were newspaper reporters for the first time who were able to go out into uh, meetings and at talks and take down verbatim what was going on and that's when the newspapers really took off and that's like for instance how Ab Abraham Lincoln probably became president because for the first time there was somebody writing down his speeches as he was doing them and it made it into the newspapers um, and then in about 1880, the typewriter was invented and in, uh, women started becoming typists. And then in about uh, 1890, there started to be women stenographer typists. And then the year about 1900, it was maybe half women and half men who were stenographer typists. And then by the year 1925, it was 95 or 96% women who were stenographer typists. So that's probably one of the reasons that shorthand has not been studied. It isn't in the academic journals. People haven't remembered what that cipher is. And, and nobody, as far as I know, has been in any archives anywhere deciphering it. So it's a whole project that's wide open. 
Um, and why did they use shorthand? It was very simple. It was technology. They didn't have they didn't have paper. Paper was expensive. Most pens and ink had to be made, so you kind of had to be sitting at a table to be able to do it. And um, shorthand. Okay, this Davida showed me, and it's a good thing too. I never would have found this. This is a book that was called a writing table, and. Um, it was like an almanac with some pages printed with uh, weather information and an astrological science, and then a lot of blank pages with wax on them that you could write on with a metal stylus and then rub it out. And I'll bet you anything that's where the expression rubbed out comes from. You were rubbed out. This is where people had to keep notes as they were walking around during the day. They, didn't, they couldn't carry paper, and you could use a metal stylus. And here is a picture from one of the shorthand manuals. And you can see their writing there. Um, and even then, if you had a little tiny book like that and you had a metal stylus, there's not much you can write. So you had to kind of cram it in. And that's why shorthand was so popular. And that's why a lot of people learned it. I think they learned it with basic literacy in their homes when they were young. I'm not sure on this. They also learn it in schools, oh. but I know the teachers, most of these systems authors are also teachers. And there were probably others who never published their systems. There's probably undocumented systems out there. So when I started looking at this, I found out that there were families of shorthand, linguistic families. There were also real actual families of shorthand, like the Gurneys and the Pittmans, but, and the Greggs even, but that, that's a separate story. The, linguistically, when you have an alphabet, there's only a certain number of um, things you can do with a pen on a piece of page. And so all the authors allot those symbols differently. And whatever <coughs> alphabet you start with, you work from there. And so one person would start one type of shorthand, um, they would die, somebody else would start teaching it, they eventually would put their name on it, they would modify it and change it, and they would die. And this continued, so you could actually do a family tree of all the various shorthand types. And the people that I'm going to be talking about today are like this J. Willis and the E. Willis. Willis was the first shorthand author, that was 1602. Um, J. Willis was John, E. Willis was Edmund, but he wasn't actually a relation to John. I think they just kept the name so that the people would know what shorthand system it was. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that can be done tracing families through time. This was an early progenitor. This is Rich in 1646 before Mason, and he published it, his system on, a, on one page. It is possible to learn a shorthand system from one page if you have a teacher or if you have a current practitioner who is able <coughs> to, to help you as you're learning it. And the reason that they tried to get it all on one page was because um, the, the printing, when you printed shorthand, it had to be copper plate engraved. It couldn't be typeset. And uh, copper plates were expensive. So this was rich before Mason. And then this is Mason in 1707, and he had this attached to the front of his book. And this is actually from a bad PDF I had of it. I patched it together in Photoshop. But then my collaborator, Andrew Otis, who I'll talk about later, um, he was in Cambridge recently, so he said, do you want me to look at anything there? And I said, yeah, could you please go look at this? So he took some pictures of it. And this is the actual thing, and this is the actual Mason book in Cambridge. Um, okay, I guess I have to talk about Andrew Otis. All along, I, was, I had in mind that I would eventually decipher Erskine, but I was writing a history. And then he wrote to me an email in about January of 2014, and he sent me this. He said, can you decipher this? And I said, I don't know, let me try. And so basically the rest of this talk now is about that process. So he was, this is Judge Hyde. There are 74 notebooks in Calcutta in Victoria Memorial Hall where um, 
that are mostly in English, but there's like 36 shorthand entries ranging from two lines to three or four pages. And he was there studying them. These notebooks were very hard to get access to. Um, he, he's a, a Fulbright and, a, and an official research scholar, but prior to that, only one other person's been in these archives, and that was somebody in 1780, and, or <clears throat> 1980. And um, he, he had to get the State Department to intercede on his behalf to get him in to see the, the notebooks. And even though Andrew was in and looking at the notebooks, they would only let him look at a, pe at a bad microfilm. So he was actually sitting at a microfilm reader in the building where the notebooks were, and they wouldn't allow him to um, look at the actual notebooks. So he, he was also only allowed to get copies, maximum 10 per day. So he was sending me documents that were official copies, which were PDFs, from the archives. And it ended up that wasn't quite enough for us to be able to work on this. So he started taking photographs of um, the microfilm reader screen. And so we have some of the shorthand in that condition. And ultimately, he met the person. There is a person going through the notebooks page by page, photographing each, which will be done eventually. And it will all fit on a CD, but you can be pretty much guaranteed that it's not going to be easily accessible. So. Um, but he did get photos of the notebook itself, which was a wonderful thing for me because I can relate much better to it now as a physical object. And he was sending me all this, and I was working on deciphering it. And the way that I was working on deciphering it was I had to guess what shorthand author it might be. And my first guess was Shelton. And the reason I picked Shelton was because Samuel Pepys's diary was written in Shelton shorthand. And it was also known to be an easy shorthand. So I started with that one. And again, this is a picture from the archive. Um, to learn Shelton, these are typical pages. Um, you learn the alphabet, which is usually pretty simple. Then you learn letter combinations, especially important ones like CH and ST, STR. But the main meat of the system is the prepositions and terminations. They're the most important thing, and a lot of them you just have to memorize because they're not necessarily related to the alphabet. They're arbitrary characters. But that is what actually the majority of our language is made up of. I now know from having sat there and parsed these lines. It's the prepositions and terminations. So they're the single most important part of any system. And I learned short, I learned Shelton. And you can memorize it, but it doesn't do you any good until you actually use it. So that, that was another reason I selected Shelton first, because there was a Peeps sample. So I used the Peeps sample to sit there and read it, decipher it, and learn to understand how these shorthand systems worked. Um, and that was useful. This is the passage about the London fire, so it was dramatic also, and lots of fun to read. Um, I, there were other things that I practiced deciphering. Many of the manuals have um, common things out of the Bible, such as the, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and that's the text that they give the students to use to practice deciphering. And in this case, I was working on deciphering Shelton's Ten Commandments, and it was very, very hard um, because it was tiny, partially. You can't really tell, but this was about two inches by two inches. And I had to blow it up in Photoshop, and I had to do this with almost everything I did, by the way. I had to blow it up in Photoshop, and then I had to move the lines apart so that there was room in between them for me to write. Um, and so I learned those. And then I had my first success. The original letter that I carried around trying to find out from people what they thought it was, I, I deciphered it. It was Shelton shorthand. And the great secret that was being hidden was it is 
It was and is my wife's opinion that the bed sold be kept for yourself <laughs> until you need it, both because tis a very good bed and the ticking is quite new and the downs will keep very well until you need them, etc. And then when I got to the bottom of the letter, it was signed James Erskine. So it wasn't even Robert <coughs> Erskine, it was a brother or a cousin. So um, that was wonderful, but in reality, I then applied it to the rest of the shorthand, which is Robert's shorthand, I think. And, um, and it didn't work. I used the same rules, I applied it to Robert Erskine, and I got nonsense. And I tried that with Hyde also. I applied the rules to him and I got nonsense. So basically I was back to square one and I had to start all over again. I started trying to learn Mason and Mason was, is widely known as like one of the most common widely used shorthands that people liked the best. But his manual turned out to be almost useless because the prepositions, he, uh, he separated his shorthand handwritten symbols from his typeset text by doing the former in the front of the manual and the rest in the rest of the manual. And so they were on different pages. So the prepositions and terminations were at the beginning, and plus they were small, they were like that big. And then the explanation is somewhere near the end. Um, so to figure out what that symbol is, you have to come here, and then there's a system of dots and dashes, that has to be explained. And that, the explanation of it was actually on the back of this page. So in order to be able to see what each one of those symbols was, you had to go to three places. And his manual was slightly longer because he included a dictionary, but he did the same thing with the dictionary. It was in the front, it was um, figures or characters next to numbers, and the numbers mapped to the words definitions at the back of the manual. So it was basically unworkable. So why would he be well known? Why would people have um, named him as one of the top authors? The reason was is because he taught it. He taught it in person and people um, learned it from him and it was a good method. And when he had to publish this manual, he didn't want to. He, the only reason he published it was because he had too many students and he, it made his life easier. He, I, he, he was against having it published at all. One of his students was the Bernies, who is a family who took over and they actually still, that firm is still in existence, although they no longer use um, Bernie shorthand. So I learned it from him instead. And also the manual was tiny. There is a person who, on the internet, holds books of different sizes for <laughs> us, which is a wonderful resource. <laughs> and then this is Andrew's hand. I've never met him, so but he says he's small. And, <laughs> and that's um, the Mason book. So I, this was a low point of the project, really low. And I was trying, all along, during this whole project, I didn't know if I could do this. We know of Pepys' the shorthand, there's a William Byrd who was a Virginian aristocrat in the 1700s. We know of his shorthand. There's some families in England who use shorthand within the family. That's known. But, you know, people are not doing this type of work. And, um, and people had told me this was undecipherable. So, I didn't know really if I could actually do this or not. But, he, and here I was learning, by now I already had Shelton in my head and I was adding Mason to it, Mason Gurney. But I was having trouble trying to um, look at the things I wanted to decipher and get a sense of what the, what different shorthands could look like or different word parts could look like. So I started deciphering them together using their, um, their little passages that they included with the manuals. And this is where I, I was very, very frustrated. Um, it was pretty agonizing. I was aware I could be wasting a lot of time. And while I was doing this, I was still looking up shorthand manuals. All of this is possible only because of the Google Digitization Project. Google was going into the various archives and libraries 
and scanning everything that is in there. And if it's published before about 1930, <coughs> the copyright is off, and you can get the entire book in a PDF. They've gone to Cambridge, they've gone to Oxford, they've gone to the New York Public Library, to the whole Michigan library system. They've scanned everything in those systems. And so those books are up there, and I don't know if the project's done now or yet, but this one, suddenly I saw a new version that I hadn't previously seen that looked like the high shorthand. So I went and looked, and it did end up being the high shorthand. But I had to learn it, so I started learning this third system, the, the Weston system, and I was excited, but I would learn some, I'd stop, I'd try to decipher, I'd fail, I would go back and learn some more, I'd stop, try to decipher. This went on for several weeks, and then finally, a couple days after I stepped down as chair, I, I deciphered my first words, and once you decipher your first words, it's absolutely wonderful because that means you can decipher the whole thing. And in this case, it was Sir Robert Chambers. And this is an S, S, R, and this is an R, and the O is assumed because this is low. So R, O, this is a B. So Rob, and then this is another R, and that's a T. And then this is a CH, so CH, and this is an M, so CH, M, R, and this is an S, S. So they just left the middle out. Robert Chambers, and they left the burrs out. So um, that's how it's done. And it was wonderful. Oh. So I started to decipher. And again, I'd blown, I'd, I'd taken screen captures of the PDFs. I'd, I'd separated lines so I could write on them. And then what I did is, because every, um, every mark can actually stand for at least two or three different things, and combinations of marks can also stand for two or three different things. I started writing down all the possibilities next to the marks, and then I would go back and I would read it out loud. And in reading it out loud, I would um, find out what things said. And this process is still ongoing. There's about 38 entries. I've probably got about 85% done. Um, and will be done fairly soon. But it, it's fairly difficult. There's, there's also arbitraries, like this here I thought was S, T, D, N, or M, but in, it's, it's actually should be. And the only way you would know that is by reading the entire manual. So I go back and review and read the manual from time to time, and still need to do that in order to be able to finish this. So once we had Hyde deciphered, we knew we could do it. Andrew Otis is on a Fulbright to study Augustus James Hickey, who was the first newspaper editor in Calcutta in 1780-ish. Um, so that's why Andrew was there in Calcutta researching the court records because Hickey was in and out of court. Um, so that's where he first saw the notebooks. And that was the, the context, that was the historical context. And it's a time and a place that I don't know anything about. So I had a lot of background reading to do, which I did and I enjoyed very much. Um, so that's a good thing about this project. It can take you to areas that you wouldn't go otherwise intellectually at least. And so why did Hyde use shorthand? Most of those 74 notebooks were in English and they're court records. He was documenting how the courts were functioning during the transition from the Mughal to the British Empire. Um, what was in the shorthand? That, that was the big secret and to know that I had to know all the background and now I'm going to give you some of the background kind of quickly, because it's a long story and India's complex, but the East India Company was still a private company. It was on the verge of becoming the British Empire. And it was in a condition where they would go bankrupt every once in a while. And in 1770s, 60s, 70s, they went bankrupt once again. And Parliament bailed them out, but they bailed them out uh, 
with the guidelines of the <coughs> India Act of 1773. And in return for it, there was to be a five-man council <coughs> to rule <coughs> Calcutta and the part of India that they were then in. And then there was only one person, which was Warren Hastings. And so there was to be <coughs> him and four others. And there was also to be a four-man Supreme Court with three judges and a chief justice, and they were responsible for, um, for enforcing the law. And so this new group of people arrived in Calcutta in 1774. This is a person about whom much has been written. Um, he, Warren Hastings was a, a, an orphan who had a relative wealthy enough to pay for his education and pay for his way to, into the East India Company. And from there, he himself worked his way up from apprentice to writer, to factor, to merchant, senior merchant. And then he became the governor general of um, part of India that they then occupied. And parliament didn't like him, was angry at him for a whole variety of different reasons. But basically, Hastings was <clears throat> allowing things to go in India as they had always gone. He was allowing like the, the Mughal and Hindu way of doing things to continue rather than making them adapt to the British way of doing things. The Supreme Court was there and they were to institute British law and um, Sir Robert Chambers was a young justice, then there was Sir Elijah Impey, who um, was the chief justice, <clears throat> and then Hyde, who is the person who wrote the notebooks. As soon as they arrived, there was conflict, because Warren Hastings thought that the jurisdiction of the court should be um, British people only. But the papers that they came with said that the jurisdiction was employees of the East India Company. And since Calcutta was actually a company town, that sort of meant everybody in Calcutta. So he, they were trying cases for everybody in Calcutta, including um, Muslim, Hindu, um, Portuguese, everybody who was there. And there were four judges originally. Hastings started trying to win them over to his side, saying, Englishmen only, and since he and Elijah Impey were friends, he won Impey over to his side first, and Chambers was sitting on the fence, and uh, Hyde and the other judge were still trying all courses that came to the courtroom, um, no matter who. But it all came to a head when Hyde, oh, the, the fourth judge died. And so Hyde was outnumbered, and it, it came to a head when he wanted to serve a writ on a Zemander, a Hindu ruler, um, to seize his property, to compel him to come into court. So he sent a sheriff out to the property to serve the writ. And when Hastings found out about it, he sent the army to intercept the sheriff and stop him. So Hastings essentially won. And Hyde had to uh, keep his opinions to himself from that point on. And that ends up being what was in the shorthand, hmm. are his opinions. So, like, and in the aftermath, the judges that supported Hastings um, benefited. The first MP got a, uh, to be chief justice over a Diwani Adilat, which is a, a location in India, which meant that he had two salaries, and the second one would also have like um, sort of customary money that would come up to him from the people. So Impey got an extra job, an extra judgeship. And then later, down here you can see some English. <coughs> no, this day Chinshura is taken. That was a Dutch city upriver and the British were still in the process of becoming an empire. So they took that city, and then Chambers got to be the judge for that area. So both of them ended up taking additional judgeships. And the fact that this was against the law it didn't matter. 
um, because it took a year for a letter to reach England or India. So there was a big gap and there was a lot of leeway. Um, so here's the translation, a partial translation of, of the lines I showed before. This very day, Sir Robert Chamb Chambers was appointed judge at Chinsura. Lady Chambers used these words alluding to his appointment. We have tried mm -hmm. honor and honesty long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's, you know, he repeats this many, many times in different passages. Every time I think he felt angry, he would, he would write out a passage. And he was disappointed because he liked Chambers a lot. Um, and he thought things should be a certain way, and, but he lost. Hastings won until, of course, the trial of Hastings, which is something that there's probably about 200 Google books about. Um, it was a nine-year trial. Hastings was recalled and impeached by Parliament. It was a nine-year trial, and MP was recalled and impeached. And Chambers was not only because everybody liked him, but he was punished because he was supposed to become chief chief judge when Impey stepped down, but the East India Company in Parliament actually kept that j job vacant for five years as punishment before they allowed him to advance to that state. So this is my collaborator, Andrew Otis, and um, I, I guess I have to say that the majority of this is both of us. So he was responsible for getting the documents We've both been reading a lot. We have our separate projects, but we also have several projects going on now um, together. And in conclusion, I would like to say that these documents, um, deciphering these documents is fairly new. I think the only way you can find them is to go to archives because people don't know, they're not cataloged, they don't know what to call them. Um, but if you find something like this, and if you want to learn how to decipher it, I will help you to learn, because it's something that we could all do. It's new historical evidence, and it, it could be, there could be large caches of it around. I don't know. But that's the end of my presentation. Questions? So when you say manuals, you mean, you mean a tree?